Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, I would like to solve a few problems uh, related to gravitational field. Now we know what gravity is about and we can solve a few problems. Uh, I would like to actually emphasize um, uh, some difference between the gravitational uh, field and its energy uh, and the um, previously researched and studied uh, nuclear energy and chemical energy. In those two cases we were not really uh, too precise, so to speak, in our laws because it's kind of complicated. It's on microscopical level of atoms and molecules. Now the, um, uh, the gravitation field is much more well, it, it's, it's palpable, it's close to us, uh, it's, it's on the macro level, so um, we can actually solve a few problems related to certain laws which we definitely know um, uh, exist, like the law of uh, universal gravity and stuff like this. So, um, these laws we will use definitely in solving these problems. I have four problems. Um, now, this lecture, obviously, as everything else, has um, very detailed notes. So if you will go to unizor.com, Physics 14, that's the course, uh, and you will go to Energy and Gravitational Field Energy, this is um, where you can find all these notes. Uh, actually, I do suggest you to use the website rather than lecture itself, which you might have found on YouTube or somewhere else because again it's a course so there are prerequisites there are detailed notes there are exams and I do recommend you to uh, to do basically the whole course rather than just one particular lecture in any case so let's consider a few problems now the problem number one is related to the fact that um, there is a concept of gravitational potential which we were studied before and um, we use the formula that on the radius r from the center of the uh, spherical gravitational for, uh, field produced by a point mass, um, there is this concept called gravitational potential, which is equal to minus g capital M divided by r, where r is the radius of distance from the point mass which uh, is origination, uh, originator of the uh, gravitational field, g is universal constant and m is the mass of the point mass which is at the center of the gravity. Now, what's strange might be, I mean it, it's not strange, what might seem strange from the first um, look, that this formula depends only on radius. Now, the physical sense of the gravitational potential is so if you have this source of the gravitational field and if you will take some kind of a probe probe object and bring it from infinity to a certain place on on the radius r from the center so the work which is done in case of probe object is of unit mass. This work from infinity to radius r is actually the gravitational potential. But now the question is what if I will change the trajectory? I mean I can go this way or I can go let's say this way to the same point. Is the work exactly the same? I mean the work depends on the only on the final radius which is just on the distance from the what if I will go to this point also on the distance r is again the work exactly the same which gravitational field has to actually do to bring the object from infinity to radius r from the uh, from the source well apparently yes and the first problem is okay can I basically support this statement that it really depends, this work depends only on the well, source and gravitational constant and the radius, the distance from the source. Okay, so that's exactly what I'm going to uh, prove right now. So, basically the statement is, prove that this work is independent 
on the trajectory as long as the final radius is, is r. Okay, so how can I do it? Here it is. Now, what is work? Work is a scalar product of the force and the distance this force is acting. Now, in case the force is actually variable, we can't really say what, what, what's the distance this force actually is acting. What we have to do, we have to go to differentials and these are vectors. And this is a scalar product. So this is the definition of the differential of work as um, the object is moved by this force along some kind of a trajectory where the force is actually dependent on trajectory. And the force does depend in this particular case because the force according to the uh, universal law of gravity, F is equal to gm m divided by r square, right? So it depends on r. Okay, fine. Now, let's consider this particular scalar product. So the force is variable, and this is the differential. Differential, let's say we are going this way. Well, this is my differential. Increment of the distance covered by this object as it is attracted uh, by the gravity field. Now, I can always represent this ds as sum of two displacements. ds as a vector, which is basically according to this, for instance, uh, trajectory. It's always directed along the trajectory, basically along the uh, tangential line, but it's an infini in infinitesimal increment along the trajectory. I can always represent it as a sum of radial and tangential displacement. So this is my radial, this is dsr, and this is my tangential, dst. So this is a simple representation of the vector as a sum of two perpendicular to each other because tangential uh, perpendicular is uh, tangential is perpendicular to um, to the radial. So what's interesting now is that after this representation, my differential of the work is equal to vector of force, which is a scalar. It's a scalar uh, product of two different vectors. Now, scalar product um, is distributive, so I can definitely say this. This is radial. Now, this tangential is perpendicular to radius. Now, the force is always radial. We know that, right? Because this is the gravity. Gravity always um, directed towards the source. So it goes always radial, which means that F and DS tangential are perpendicular to each other. And that's why, as a perpendicular to each other vectors, their scalar product is zero. And we have only this. So basically what I'm, say what I'm saying is we can completely ignore all movements uh, which are perpendicular to, to the radius. And we can, all, we can only consider the movement towards the radius. And then if we would like to move to this point, for instance, well, we move to this point and then this point. And this perpendicular to the radius movement doesn't really produce any uh, work uh, by the gravitational field. Because whenever you are moving without changing the, the radius, your work is equal to zero because you are moving perpendicularly to the force. So the force doesn't really make, doesn't really do any work. 
So that's why, regardless of whatever your trajectory is, any kind of a perpendicular to the radius can be completely uh, ignored, and only the movement along the radius is important. And that's what actually results in this formula, which is independent on, on the trajectory or the place where I'm uh, ending, as long as it's on the radius r from this particular place. For instance, how can I get to this place? Well, I can go this way and then along the circle always perpendicularly to the radius move to this one and this doesn't generate any extra work. So I can go to any point um, by doing only radial uh, movements and tangential to the radius. And the second one doesn't really produce any work, so that's why this is as a representation of the work which is done by the field uh, by, by bringing it from the infinity to the radius r, r, r if, 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 if it's a unit object, unit, ma unit mass object. So that's why it's completely independent of trajectory and uh, uh, and the place where exactly we are ending our um, movement, as long as it's on the radius r from the source. Okay, so that was my first problem, uh, which basically justifies the formula as it is. So this is amount of work which field does by bringing, by attracting the object of the unit mass from infinity to a concrete distance r from the center. Okay, so let me go to the second problem. Let me just wipe it out. Okay. Second problem would be a little bit more involved mathematically. Um, why do we actually pay so much attention to the gravitational potential? Well, obviously I was explaining that it really defines the field. At every point, if I know the gravitational potential, I can find out exactly where the gravitational force and what's the, uh, what's the direction of the gravitational force and what's its magnitude, etc. However, there is one much more important um, quality of this concept of gravitational potential. It's additive, which means if you have two different sources of um, gravitation, let's say you have the Moon and the Earth, and now somewhere around this pair of, um, of bodies, uh, the gravitational uh, force obviously exists, but separately Earth's attract something and moon attract something. How can I do whatever the calculations are required to find out what's my combined gravitational force? And this is always a very important um, point to uh, basically to, to spend some time on because obviously all our space traveling depends on many different space objects like Sun and, and Moon and, and Earth and some planets, etc. Each one of them contribute their own gravitational field. And what is exactly the result? What's the resulting gravitational field produced by many objects? So, my point is that if you know separately the gravitational um, uh, potential of each individual component of each individual um, uh, object in, in space, which is a source of gravitation, then the gravitational potential of all of them together acting at any point is a sum of each individual gravitational potential. So it's extremely important for all the calculations. Well, now I have to somehow prove it, right? Now, the proof in a very general case is kind of cumbersome. Whatever I'm going to do right now is basically to prove this in two 
for, for two uh, equal in mass objects um, and uh, not in every point around them but on a perpendicular bisector between them. So it's an easier problem and it's uh, easy enough to, to present it to you and I would like to say that basically the other more complicated problems when the objects are, are not of equal mass, the sources, and um, you are not actually going in the middle between them but somewhere else, these are all calculated in a very similar fashion, just more cumbersome calculations. So I will concentrate on this relatively simple case. So I will have two masses of equal size and I would like to have a perpendicular bisector between them and what I'm saying is that if I will take and calculate the gravitational potential at any point on this bisector um, then its gravitational potential equals to sum of the gravitational potentials of components um, in a way it's similar to the way how we add forces if you have two forces two vectors we can just you know add them together and basically the whole proof is based on the addition of vectors so this particular let me just reverse it a little bit so it will be exactly like in my notes so my uh, masses are here so this is let's say r and this is r and i'm going to a point on the uh, distance h from the midpoint between them so this is mass and this is mass now again i would like to calculate the gravitational potential in this particular point now let's go back to the definition of gravitational potential it's the work done by the gravitational field now the combined gravitational field uh, to bring this object from infinity to this particular point so my object here let's have its mass m actually in the very, at the very end I'll put m is equal to 1 because gravitational potential is related to the work done by the gravitational field to bring the object of the unit mass to this position so let's say it's m right now now there are um, two forces which are acting one along this line along and one along this line they are the same so if my position is x somewhere here 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 we're bringing from infinity to this point h so r r regardless of where exactly this if this is x let's calculate this force and this force then we will add them together we will add them together as vectors it's this way and this way so addition would be here obviously on the same bisector because these forces are obviously equal in magnitude now if this angle is phi so what can I say about some of these forces? Well, first of all, the magnitude of each of those forces is G M M divided by the square of a distance, right? This is the universal law of gravity. Square of a distance, if this is on the height X and this is R, that would be X squared plus R squared. Now this is force now this is one force now this is another force when we have to add them together we basically have to add them again as a components each force can be represented as sum of this and this so this is this force and this one is sum of this plus this now these two are opposite in direction and equal in magnitude so they nullify each other these forces the components along this axis are adding together so each one of them is if this is f now this is phi this is phi 
so this is f times sine phi and then we have another f times sine uh, sine sin, sin phi so we have 2f times sine phi, sin phi right so this is the force which is acting as a result of addition of two vectors vector of force this vector of force that when we add them together this is the result a magnitude and it's always directed down because again these forces are equal in size angles are equal everything is equal so that's why it goes perpendicularly down so my object is moved from infinity from over there down 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 to this point at the height h how can i calculate the work well if i know the force and i know basically the trajectory so i have to just uh, uh, now for forces function of x obviously where x is the distance from the midpoint so um, what I have to do I have to multiply it by uh, differential of x and integrate from infinity to to h so my total work would be integral from infinity to h um, to f which is this g m m divided by x squared okay uh, that's my work that's my force I mean and if I will multiply this force oh, sorry plus r square now I have to multiply it by sine of f now what is the sine of f sine of f well this is uh, x divided by uh, square root of x square plus h pl plus r square right so sine of f would be um, x divided by square root of x square plus r square so this is sine of this f right as the point moves x is its location its distance from if points move from infinity down to h at any point the sign is equal to x divided by hypotenuse which is square root of x square plus plus r square by the way i use lowercase r not uppercase all right and i have to now this is the force okay now I have to multiply it by distance d, dx that's a displacement so this is the force acting on this distance and now I integrate it to get a complete work so this is my, my, my work okay from now on it's just pure mathematical manipulations I can rewrite it as 2 g m m integral infinity h um, x dx divided by x square plus r square to the power 3 seconds, right? This is 1 and this is half, so it's 1 and a half, it's 3 seconds. All right, how, how can I calculate this particular integral? Well, it happens that this particular integral is really very easy. Sometimes you can get integrals where, when it's very difficult to do. Here is just a very simple substitution. So if you will substitute y equals to um, x squared plus r squared. Now dy is equal to 2x dx right so you see 2x dx and this is y so what we have is g m m integral dy dy which is this 2x dx divided by y to the power of 3 seconds that's a very simple thing, right? 
The only thing I have to think about is my limits. Well, if x is equal to infinity, y is equal to infinity. That's easy. Now, if x is equal to r, y is equal to 2r to square, right? Okay. So, now we don't need this picture. Now we can integrate this thing. Well, um, the indefinite integral of y to the power of minus 3 seconds. Now minus, you see this is a uh, denominator, so I put it on the top, so I put minus here, dy. Now what is in, uh, in indefinite in integral of this? Well, this is, um, well, again, integral of y to the k d dy is equal to um, y to the power of k plus 1 divided by k plus 1, right? Plus c. So, in this particular case, um, we will have k plus 1, it's uh, minus 1 second, so it's y1 one, one, 1 second, divided by minus 1 second plus c. Well, c we don't really need c, because we are talking about definite integral in these uh, limits. So we have g m m um, minus uh, 2 Right? Divided by one half, it's multiplied. Um, and this is one over square root of y, right? Something like this. From infinity to 2r square. Why r square? I'm sorry. To h. H, not R, I have to substitute. So it's H squared plus R squared, not 2R squared. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is my result. So let's just convert it into a more compact formula. Which means... Well, first of all, obviously, the infinity uh, would give me zero here. So we can disregard it. So we only have to substitute the first one. And the result would be and 2 minus um, 1 over square root of r square plus h square. But this is a great formula because let's return back to our drawing. What is the potential at this point of only this particular mass. Well, that's g m uh, divided by uh, the distance. And the distance is square root of r square plus h square. Same thing here. Now, but with a minus sign, obviously. Now, if m is our unit mass, because we are talking about the work which performed by, uh, uh, on the unit mass, we will have here exactly double here, one and another. So potential at this point of two um, uh, point masses is exactly the same as sum of potentials of each one of those. 
And that's exactly what I wanted to prove. That this is that the, that the gravitational potential is additive. If you add more sources of gravity, each one contributes certain gravitational potential and the gravitational potential of the combined system of all these bodies is exactly the sum of each individual um, gravitational potential. So that's what's very, very important. Gravitational potential is additive. Now, knowing that, we can probably calculate more or less what is exactly my gravitational potential at any point in space. Because, for instance, not far from the Moon, we have gravitational potential of Moon and, uh, and Earth. And if you want to, um, uh, to land on the Moon, you have to really take into account everything, right? And everything means you have to really add the potentials of each, of each, of each body, of Earth separately from the Moon, add them together, and that would be the potential at any point. And knowing gravitational potential, you basically know where exactly the force of gravity is directed and what's its magnitude, because everything is the function from the gravitational potential. Now, I proved it only in this particular case. I told you in the very beginning this is a kind of a simple case. Now, obviously, you can um, make it more uh, difficult by having different masses in this particular case, and this uh, body not being uh, somewhere in the middle line, uh, perpendicular bisector, but somewhere else. So it will be M1, M2, and the point will be somewhere here, which can be defined by something, uh, whatever, whatever the, whatever the definition is, by distances, for instance, or angles, or whatever. All I'm saying is, we can go through detailed calculations and do the same thing exactly, and you will see exactly the same result. So, gravitational potential is additive. That's very, very important property, which, um, which is used everywhere, wherever you are calculating anything related to gravity of more than one um, source. All right. And now, for a much simpler case, I have two, basically, one uh, algebraic manipulation uh, needed uh, problems. Now, my problem number three is I would like to express the mass of, um, uh, of the source of gravity as a function of um, the free fall acceleration on its surface and the radius of that surface. Now, I'm assuming that we're talking about um, the spherical sources, like planets, basically. And I do consider that we're talking about ideal case. So, the planet is ideal, um, uh, ideal sphere with a point mass uh, concentrated in, in the very center of this planet. And now we are on the surface uh, which has a radius r and we can measure the, um, the free fall acceleration. How can we find out the mass of the planet if we know that on the radius r the acceleration is such and such? Well, very simply. Well, we can measure the weight of any object knowing the free fall acceleration. This is the force actually which pushes down um, uh, my probe object uh, which is on the surface of the planet. At the same time, we know that the gravitational, uh, the, the force of gravitation depends on uh, gravitational constant, mass of the planet, mass of the probe object, divided by square of the distance between them. And distance between them is the radius right now, right? So this is the planet, we are here. But we are thinking that all my mass is concentrated in the center, and this is the radius. Well, from here, we obviously don't need this. And uh, our mass is equal to 
uh, g r squared divided by g. So this is the free fall acceleration, this is the universal constant, and this is the radius. So this is basically how we express mass in terms of, and that's how we can actually weight the, um, the Earth, how much, what, what exactly the mass of the Earth is. Knowing geometrical um, uh, characteristics such as radius, which probably is not so difficult to find out, and uh, just uh, free fall acceleration, which we can always measure on the surface. All right, next, as easy. So next I would like to express in the same terms the gravitational potential of the um, uh, gravitational field based on, again, the same thing, based on something which we can measure. So why, why am I exercising? Because G and R can be measured with our own technology. Um, mass of the Earth is not so easy to measure, right? So that's why I wanted to have this problem and um, gravitational potential also can be expressed in these terms. Now, again, we know that the gravitational potential is equal to G M divided by R, all right? So that, that was basically the result of the definition which is a work which is performed by gravitational field to bring the probe object of the unit mass from infinity to the radius r, to the distance r from the center. Now, we already know what m is from the previous problem, right? Which is g r squared divided by capital G. So that means g m, which is g r squared divided by g, oops, capital G, and r. So this, 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 gr. So multiplication of um, acceleration of the free fall on the surface of Earth times the radius of the Earth gives us the magnitude of the gravitational potential on the surface of Earth. OK, these are four problems. I do suggest you to to try especially the problem number two, where I have two bodies. Um, just try to do yourself uh, the same problem. If you, are, if, you, if you want to challenge, then you can try even the more complicated problem to prove that um, gravitational potential is additive in general case, like not necessarily two equal masses and not necessarily along the bisector between them. So that would be great if you can do it. In any case, read the notes for this lecture. It's always useful and it's presented on unisor.com in Physics for Teens course. Um, now this website is completely free. There are no advertisement and it also contains some other courses. Um, the Math, Math for Teens, which is prerequisite for this course, and there are some civic courses. So I do suggest you to visit the website. That's it. Thank you very much and good luck.